Hello, everybody. How are you? Saying hello to all our viewers at home, at work, and wherever you are. My name is Samson Z, your moderator, and once again, welcome to a health talk program entitled "Shake the Salt Habit to Lower Your Hypertension." And of course, ladies and gentlemen, today's session focuses on how prolonged overconsumption of sodium can lead to hypertension and how we can manage our sodium intake and keep hypertension at bay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we all know that hypertension is a risk factor of cardiovascular disease. But did you know that one factor that contributes to the hypertension is a high consumption of sodium? Well, you might ask, why do sodium, or rather, where do sodium come from? Is sodium the same as salt? Why do we need to shake off our salt habit? Well, these questions will be asked, or rather, will be answered by our speakers today. So let's introduce our panel of speakers today. We have first Prof Tan Hui Chim, Chairman, Singapore Heart Foundation, Senior Consultant, Department of Cardiology, National University of Heart Center, Singapore, and also we have Ms. Natalie Yeo, our Dietitian, Singapore Heart Foundation, and also joining us as well, Ms. Chan Pui Yi, Assistant Principal Physiotherapist, Singapore Heart Foundation. So ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to shake off the salt habit? Well, let's dive right into understanding the relation between salt and hypertension and what we can do to reduce risk of high blood pressure. So first question is for Prof Tan. Now Prof Tan, how does salt affect our blood pressure? So Samson, let me just start out by differentiating between salt and sodium because it can be quite confusing. So, uh, so actually salt is made out of sodium and chloride. So 40% of uh, salt is made out of sodium and 60% is made out of chloride. And so sodium is obviously the key component that we are looking at here because uh, sodium is responsible for our normal well-being as well as some of our cellular uh, normal function. So sodium is required in our normal life and that uh, it is actually found most commonly in the common salt that we consume. In fact, I think it accounts for about 90% of our sodium intakes besides the naturally occurring sodium in our natural food. So we all know three facts here. First of all, excessive sodium increases the risk of hypertension. That's mm -hmm. important. And it's actually particularly so in a group of patients uh, whom we call salt sensitive. The second fact I want to tell the audience here is that uh, when you reduce your sodium intake, you reduce your risk of hypertension. And that has been proven quite, quite in a number of studies here. And that reduction is a linear one. That means the lower your sodium intake, the lower your blood pressure go. And what is even more uh, uh, important here is that while sodium lowers the blood pressure, sodium reduction lowers the blood pressure, it not only lowers blood pressure, in a hypertensive person, but in a normal person, it can also lower blood pressure, although the magnitude of reductions may not be the same. But whatever it is, certainly a reduction of sodium will bring about a reduction in blood pressure. And the third important fact that we need to recognize here is that when you reduce sodium, now we have a pretty strong evidence to show that it actually reduces the complications of stroke and death. So for sure, when you reduce your sodium intake, you actually make yourself healthier with a lower risk of a complication. So the question then is, how much of a sodium do we need? We need about uh, 500 milligram or 0.5 gram of sodium a day. And so that will translate to about uh, for normal functioning. But we do recommend that you can actually consume up to maybe a 2 gram of sodium a day. I think the WHO recommendations is a 5 gram of salt. So one gram of sodium is equivalent to 2.5 gram of salt. So you can take two grams of sodium or you can take five grams of salt per day. Now obviously if you take more, then of course, uh, then the risk of all the uh, high blood pressures and comes in. And mind you, you know, the average amount of uh, salt that Singaporeans consume is about nine grams per day. So that's a huge amount of uh, sodium that we are consuming every day. So how does actually sodium affect the blood pressure? It's actually a very complex uh, uh, mechanism. But suffice to say is that sodium regulates the amount of fluid in our body. So the more sodium you take, you expand the volume inside your body. It also alters the way the kidney uh, deal with the excess salt. And it also changes some of the hormonal levels in the body system. So all in all, the increased amount of uh, sodium consumed translate into a raised level of blood pressure in the person and increases his risk 
of hypertension. Well, there you go. What a detailed explanation, ladies and gentlemen. Now over to our next speaker, Natalie. Now, Natalie, how much sodium is too much? Mm, yes, so like what Prof Tan mentioned, our recommended daily sodium intake is actually about less than 5 grams a day or less than 2,000 milligrams a day, which is equivalent to less than 1 teaspoon a day. So based on the latest National Nutrition Survey, about 90% of Singaporeans are actually consuming close to double the recommended amount of um, sodium intake a day. So sodium can actually be found in all our foods around, okay? not only limited to our packaged, processed food items, it is even in some of our natural, all of our natural food items as well. So like what um, Prof Tan mentioned earlier, our bodies actually need um, approximately around 500 milligrams of sodium a day to function. Okay, so that's actually equivalent to less than a quarter teaspoon of salt a day. Okay, which is very, very few people are actually coming close to having less than that amount. Okay, so Samson, okay, just a question. Do you think if we were to eat three main meals a day, without any sauces, without any salt and seasoning, Will we still meet our recommended daily sodium intake rec recommendation? I don't know. I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't think so. Okay, let me just break it down for <laughs> you. The answer is actually yes. Really? Yeah, because a lot of the sodium um, actually also comes from our fresh and natural foods. So we don't need additional salt and seasoning and we can actually meet up to our recommended about 500 milligrams a day. Mm. So what does that look like, right? So for example, like for breakfast, we might like to have like a breakfast set. Maybe two slices of bread and two, slice, uh, and two eggs. And maybe for lunch, we might have a palm size of grilled salmon uh, with our dishes. And for dinner, we might have like a palm size of chicken breast. Okay, and that very much already adds up to about 540 milligrams, which is actually what our bodies require a day. Hmm. Naturally, naturally. Yes, naturally. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes. Interesting, interesting. I didn't know that. I thought we had to have always have extra to maybe you yes. know, put a bit of taste as well. Mm. But uh, in, in actual fact, we don't have to. Yes. I see there. So That's there you right. go, viewers. Just take note that uh, maybe right now you can start reducing your MSG and a bit more of your <laughs> sodium and salt as well because in the natural uh, food that we have, it's, you know, there's enough natural salt in, in it as well. Yeah? Yes, Amazing definitely. discovery. Mm. Uh, yes. I just want to add one point here is that uh, most of us actually do prefer a little bit of salt in our, in our food. And so conceptually, you can imagine that there is a bliss point at which uh, at some level of salt will add to the flavor or the taste mm. of a flu food, you see. The question here is, uh, what's the bliss point here? Mm. How much is tolerable? And actually, this bliss point uh, is what we term quite malleable. That means you can actually teach people to adapt to a certain level of sodium intake while preserving the sort of taste of the food. So it comes about with a different uh, food design and preparation and mm, so forth. I see. All right, moving along, uh, back to Natalie again. Now, the next question is, what can we do if we find that we have taken a high-sodium meal? Do we drink a ton of water to flush out the sodium? Mm, okay, so this is actually a myth that has been heard around that if I drink lots of water, am I able to flush out the sodium in our bodies? Okay, the answer is actually no, it's a myth. Mm, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so what happens is that excessive um, sodium intake over time, even with um, a lot of water that we are um, having in, it will actually not counteract the effects of a high sodium diet. Okay, so what happens is that excessive um, high sodium diet over time, what it does is that our bodies will start to retain water, and this can increase our blood volume. And what happens is, is that it forces our heart to work harder and pump harder, and it could increase our blood pressure. So this could result in high blood pressure. And high blood pressure can actually result in a lot of long-term complications like um, what Prof Tan mentioned, heart diseases, stroke, and also kidney disease as well. So um, excessive sodium consumption is definitely um, something that we always um, struggle with, but it's definitely a habit that is cultivated over time. So um, when it comes to uh, reducing our sodium intake, maybe it's too late that you decided to reduce our sodium intake and it's never too late. Yeah, so there are actually a few um, things that we can actually do to, um, like what um, Prof. Tan mentioned, that's that bliss point. So we can actually retrain our taste buds to get used to a lower sodium diet. Okay, and of course, back 
to the healthy balanced diet. So a healthy balanced diet has been um, shown and proven to actually support you when you're trying to transition to a lower sodium um, diet meal and of course helps to prevent hypertension as well. So in our SHF, we actually um, use our heart smart um, eating plate concept. So that is actually um, a plate that helps you with portion size management and also ensure that you're getting a variety of nutrients that um, will help to support when it comes to reducing your blood pressure. So when it comes to the um, heart smart eating plate, what it looks like is that a quarter of a plate Mm, yes, a quarter <laughs> will be filled with your whole grains, okay, preferably. So um, we encourage um, to have brown rice, um, oats, quinoa, millet, okay, barley. There's so many different whole grains out there. So sometimes when I'm in the health wellness um, center, some of the patients might say, I don't really fancy brown rice yet. I'm not used to the taste of brown rice. Yeah, are you used to the taste that? No. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's a common thing that's happening. Okay, so what happens is that, um, but a lot of people could like other types of whole grains, like they could like um, oats, they could like millet. Okay, so what we can actually do is, for example, if you are very used to eating white rice, you can mix in some of the other whole grains when you are cooking. You could mix in oats with your white rice, you could mix in some millet with your white rice. So this can actually increase the amount of whole grain consumption that you are having throughout the day. So when it comes to making dietary changes, what we really want to focus on is that the little, little steps actually is the thing that we are looking for. So we want to make sure it's a sustainable change. So instead of doing something that you really dislike, why not try to mix in a little bit around with that white rice and oats and you know millet that you enjoy. So this will increase the whole grain consumption. Okay, so another quarter plate, okay, yes. <laughs> will actually be your um, lean proteins, okay, so about a palm-sized portion. So what we encourage is that um, to go for lean meats like lean chicken, um, lean meats and also um, fish. And white meat, would you say? Would it, would it, would it be white meat? Lean yeah, meat? yeah, so lean chicken breast preferably. Mm. So lean, um, lean meats actually are important because when it comes to the fatty cuts of meats, um, it's associated with the increase of saturated fats um, which can increase our risk of you know, um, heart diseases and things like that. So so we try to go for the lean um, protein as much as we can. And of course, there's also vegetarian sauces like tofu, uh, beans as well, tempeh, that we can also incorporate in our diets as well. So another half a plate, okay, which is the bigger part of the plate, yes. <laughs> so that part we actually encourage to um, consume fruits and vegetables. Mm, so fruits and vegetables are actually very high in fiber content. So that can really help with our um, you know, management of um, blood pressure and also our heart um, health as well. So that's uh, SHF, Heart Smart Eating Plate concept. But of course, when it comes to you know, um, um, health management, it's also important to take note that um, active lifestyle is also very essential. So I think um, exercise is paramount. And today, Pui will really, really share with us a lot more about exercise. So the recommendation is about 150 uh, minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise a week has actually been shown to reduce blood pressure as well. Mm, mm. Interesting there, ladies and gentlemen, from Natalie. I've been doing it the other way around. I've been having like one half of rice and a quarter with just little veggies and no fruits at all. So that's kind of bad for, for myself. And I'm sure some of you may have done that before. So it's time to make a change of having a quarter rice, brown rice preferred, and of course uh, the remaining portions. So, and also, I admit also, I, I, I'm a fan of uh, barbecue potato chips. So that's very high in sodium and, and whatnot. So this is the best time to start cutting down if you have been consuming those unhealthy food. Okay? So let's move over right now to Puyi. Puyi over here. Now, how does exercise help to remove sodium? from our body? Well, exercise makes us sweat and sweat contains sodium. So technically, yes, when you exercise, you can lose, um, you can sweat and you can lose a bit of sodium. But sweating rates differ from person to person and it also depends on factors such as the environment, how hot is the weather and how much are you exercising? Are you running up a hill or are you just doing a very slow walk? So we wouldn't count on exercise to help us to reduce sodium because um, you, you really need a lot, a lot of exercise to make you, help you reduce the sodium. Yep. Mm, I see. So, well, some people might say, well, if, such, such that if exercise can remove my sodium, does it mean that I should exercise less or exercise more or I can, I can take more sodium because I exercise? 
Well, uh, we definitely do not say that you can take more sodium if you exercise, unless you are a professional athlete who is actually training under the hot sun every day for long hours, then yes, you, you can take a little bit more sodium, correct me if I'm wrong. But otherwise, if you are quite sedentary and you're only doing 30 minutes or even one hour a day of exercise, then no, we will not recommend that you, that you, that you supplement your sodium because you are exercising. Yes. Mm. Well, I, was, I would concur that because I was a national tennis player back then. We used to exercise a lot and we do uh, sweat a lot of salt. And sometimes the salt dries up on our, on our feet. But we, when, we, when we touch it, we can feel the small granules or little you know, uh, salt. So yes, uh, we do also consume a lot of salt and uh, we, we sweat a lot as well. But right now, if you're not exercising a lot, uh, if you're not exercising, uh, you know, eat too much and you need to really reduce based on your current condition, not previously. So well said there as well. Uh, but uh, now let's move on to Prof Tan, ladies and gentlemen, for the next question. Now, how long will it take before we start to see the effect of daily overconsumption of sodium on our body? What should we see? Well, the impact of sodium on the uh, body is, uh, is pretty quick. So I think if you uh, consume huge amount of uh, or overconsume uh, uh, a significant amount of sodium, you, you're going to see your fluctuations in the blood pressure. And, but it's not the short-term fluctuations in blood pressure that we are concerned with. Actually, I'm more interested in the long-term impact of a persistently elevated blood pressure, and that is what hypertension is all about. Mm -hmm. So short-term changes in terms of blood pressure related to the amount of sodium you consume really doesn't matter in a lot. But the notion that uh, salt can actually impact on the health uh, really starts way back in the 1980s, and now we increasingly know that it is becoming a, a true fact and so far. So, so, so uh, in life, I would recommend that uh, you know, one do not have to be uh, you know, very, very stringent, but I, I would adopt a moderated uh, approach in everything that you do in life, you know, be it diet, exercise, and so forth, to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Better, better be safe than sorry, yeah? mm. because the discovery of having too much sodium just comes after 20, 30 years from the 80s to now, and mm -hmm. it's a bit late. We are all, I'm already in my 50s right now, so I must have consumed a lot of salt <laughs> more than rice. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we have to really take care of, like, if you can, you can reverse time, this is the best time to start right now, today. Yeah? Okay, so uh, you talk about hypertension a lot, hypertension a lot. Now, what are the signs and symptoms to look out for hypertension? Okay, so first of all, hypertension differs from high blood pressure. When we say high hypertension, it means a persistently elevated blood pressure. As opposed to high blood pressure, your blood pressure can be elevated because you're exercising, you're stressed, you're angry, or you just consume some alcohol and so forth. So fluctuating blood pressure is not hypertension, but a persistently elevated blood pressure is hypertension. And hypertension, unfortunately, uh, well, it's very common. It occurs maybe in about a quarter of the populations from about 30 to 69 years of age, and perhaps even higher when it goes uh, older, above 70, 80, you might be looking at 50% of occurrence of uh, hypertension. So while it is a very prevalent condition, uh, it is a silent killer. So it doesn't cause symptoms uh, uh, in the large majority of time. In fact, it is only diagnosed if you happen to check your blood pressure either because of a uh, uh, medical consult or on your own self-monitoring. So I would say that the single, large majority of patients with hypertension would have no symptoms and by the time you develop symptoms, some form of complications may have occurred. And we talk about complications here, uh, we can talk about people having heart attack because mm -hmm. of uh, hypertension. We can talk about patients having heart failure because of high blood pressure. A hypertension, and then you can have other complications such as uh, kidney impairment, of which uh, hypertension and diabetes are two of the commonest causes of end stage renal failure in this country. And then you have people who lose their eyesight because of hypertension. But to me, the most devastating complication of hypertension is stroke, because the morbidity and the mortality that comes with it is considerable, and especially so if the affected patient is a very young person. So I, I feel that with all these uh, potential complications of hypertension, certainly there's a, uh, a, you know, a need to actually look at the control of it, and one part of it will be to reduce the sodium intake. Mm. So let's say if I have discovered that I have hypertension, what are the steps that I, I can do to reduce hypertension? Hmm. So I think there are two ways to deal with hypertension. First is your lifestyle, and secondly will be medicine. 
And so when we look at a person uh, with hypertension, uh, we like to look at him as a, as a whole person. What is the risk profile of this person? Does he have any other risk factors that come alongside with this hypertension? For example, does he smoke? Does he have diabetes? Does he have already kidney impairment or has he got previous history of stroke or heart attack already? So this gives me an idea of what sort of stroke prof uh, uh, risk profile am I dealing with. Now in somebody who is very young and in his, uh, he's been well all this while and he's just been found to have uh, uh, elevated uh, blood pressure, the general recommendation here is lifestyle modification first. So when we talk about lifestyle modification, uh, certainly uh, from a diet standpoint, reducing the salt intake is important. So I think if you can reduce the sodium to 1.5 gram uh, per day, that will be very helpful. <coughs> reducing your weight is another important way to control your blood pressure. Certainly exercise, certainly uh, uh, stop smoking if you are uh, 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 somebody who smokes, and certainly Managing stress is another component of uh, uh, blood pressure man, uh, management. Now, when lifestyle measures alone cannot control the blood pressure to the level that we want, then we have to consider uh, some kind of uh, medicines to complement the lifestyle uh, uh, changes. So, uh, so, so just remind ourselves what is hypertension. When we say you have hypertension, we are talking about your blood pressure being more than 140, 90. Uh, most of the time. And this is uh, readings uh, taken in the clinic. But if you happen to do your own blood pressure uh, monitoring at home, which we do recommend, so anything average 135, 85 and above will be considered a hypertension because in general, your blood pressure tends to be lower when you're at home doing it yourself and if it's uh, 135, 85 and above, then that will be considered a hypertension. So look out for these readings as you uh, check your BP with your doctor or by yourself. Well, there you go. And if you just join us, like to say hello, everybody, welcome down. And once again, don't forget, this is our Health Talk program, Shake the Salt Habit to Lower Hypertension. If you have any questions, hold on, because later on, we're going to get some questions from you uh, as you type in. Yeah, but let's move along right now. Let's move to Puyi, as we are prof just talk about sports, lifestyle, and also exercise as well. Puyi, how does exercise play a role in lowering blood pressure, and why is it important to exercise? Okay, so first of all, when you exercise regularly, your risk of being overweight and being obese definitely decreases. Okay, because exercise burns off all your calories. And when you are not obese, your risk of getting heart disease, stroke, and many other health problems decreases. And your risk of getting hypertension also decreases. So obesity is very well correlated with um, hypertension. A physically active person is very is about thirty to fifty percent less likely to have um, to have hypertension. So why does this happen? Because when you exercise over the short term, your blood vessels tend to widen and relax. So this re this widened blood vessels uh, helps to bring down your blood pressure in the short term, and the effect can be seen up to twenty two hours immediately after exercise. So you can see up to one four to fifteen mmHg of decrease in blood pressure. Uh, for people with hypertension, this can be even more significant, up to 5 to 7 mmHg of drop in blood pressure. Uh, so when you exercise regularly, your blood pressure will tend to drop. Exercise also promotes new growth of blood vessels, and so when there's more blood vessels, there's less, uh, less pressure on the blood vessels. Um, absolute increases, decreases in blood pressure it may seem very small, if you look at it, it's like, oh, it's only less than 5 mmHg. But even this small amount is clinically very significant. It can reduce your risk of heart disease by 7% and by stroke by 10%. Wow. We will take all the chances we can if we are <laughs> from that certain age group, right? So uh, that's, that's good enough for, for, for me. Now, when you talk about exercises, so what is the recommended amount of exercise needed for each adult? Is, does it differ from one individual? In general, for the whole population, you can stick to this magic number of 150 minutes a week. Okay, so 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise. So it's the same for people with hypertension. Uh, try to get 150 minutes of uh, exercise a week. Um, and what we, some examples of moderate intensity exercise are like brisk walking, cycling, hiking, recreational sports, and so on. Uh, frequency, we will recommend somebody with hypertension to do aerobic exercise for three to four times a week. 
And examples of aerobic exercise will be things like walking, jogging, cycling, swimming, um, yeah, uh, light dancing. Okay? Uh, but we will recommend, if you have hypertension, to try to get in exercise almost every day if you can. Because as I said before, an exercise, a short period of exercise, helps to reduce your blood pressure up to 22 hours immediately after the exercise. So imagine if you exercise every day, you will get this 22 hours of protection from your hypertension. Okay? Um, resistance exercise is also very important. And what we mean by resistance exercise are your dumbbells, are your weights, your squats, your things like your push-ups and things like that. So these helps to maintain your muscle mass and they are also very important. Uh, intensity depends on your fitness as well as your medical condition. So if you have illness and you're not so fit, then we will recommend that you start with a lower intensity exercise where you do not feel so short of breath and you do not feel like you're exerting so much while you're exercising. Type of exercise, as I mentioned before, will be things like swimming, cycling, walking. Walking is a very, very good uh, exercise that you can do anywhere and uh, on most days of the week. Uh, finally, the time. Okay, the time, as I said before, we would recommend up to 150 minutes a week. And per day, we, we try to aim for 30 to 60 minutes. But if you are not fit and you have some medical condition, you can start with as low as even 2 minutes or even 5 minutes and you gradually build it up. Yep. There you go. So basically, you have to trust your body. If you're new to exercise or recovering from certain illness, always start something slow. A walk will do, yeah? or some resistance at home, and then to maybe you can start working out a bit more, uh, minor jogging or light jog and all that. So please trust yourself, but exercise, uh, you know, don't, don't uh, not do it. You have to do it in some form of at least 30 minutes a day of some sweating, yeah, yep. or perspiration. Yes. All right, now, um, if, uh, if, like for example, if I am a hypertension patient, uh, should, what should I take note when I, when I exercise? Okay, if you're a hypertension patient, always follow up with your doctor. Always check your blood pressure at home, like Prof Tan mentioned. Check at home, record it down, uh, check at different times of the day. Um, uh, secondly, before you actually exercise, before you actually put on your gears and take out your water bottles and go and exercise, take a blood pressure reading. If you find that your blood pressure reading is a bit too high or a bit too low from your normal, so let's say your usual us is usually 130, but today you are recording 150 then maybe it's time to either skip that session or go for a very easy session because you are a little bit different from your normal. Or if, let's say, your blood pressure is very, very high, uh, your systolic blood pressure is 180 or more, then yes, we will definitely recommend that you skip that session. Or if it so happens that somehow that day your blood pressure is actually very low, so for example, your systolic blood pressure is less than 90, then again, we will advise you to maybe it go a bit easier if that is not your normal or to skip that session. But if let's say your normal has always been 90 plus and we do see this in some of our clients, then it's okay to carry on if this has always been your normal and you've always been able to tolerate the session. Mm. Thank you very much for the information. Now let's cross over to Natalie. Now Natalie, a question for you is, what healthy eating habits do you recommend in the case of reducing uh, risk of hypertension? And how can we shake off our salty habits? Mm. So when it comes to shaking off our salty habits, we can actually retrain our taste buds and reduce our salt cravings. Mm. Mm. So Samson, have a guess. What is the lifespan of our taste buds? I don't know, as long as I live. As long as you live, that's an awesome answer. Okay, so the lifespan of our taste bud is approximately around 10 days. Okay, so it actually renews itself three times a month. So that's good news, isn't it? Because we are always encouraging everyone to uh, reduce our sodium intake gradually and progressively. And what it actually does is that our older taste buds that was accustomed to a high sodium diet will start to get replaced by new ones. So our salt preference will actually start to decrease. And what happens is that um, previously the, the taste that salt was actually masking, we might start to taste them as well. And our salt taste threshold will start to be much easier and better as well. So what happens is that all it takes is about three weeks okay, for a slowly habit to form when it comes to a lower sodium diet. So when, when it comes to that, um, we want to make sure that because when we go into a lower sodium diet, about three weeks, um, our taste buds will start to get more sensitive. Okay, so um, when that um, happens, um, our threshold becomes much easier. So 
Going cold turkey is actually really, really hard. So we try our best not to just um, stop our sodium intake. Um, instead, like what we mentioned, gradual and slow changes can actually go a very, very long run. So um, let's take a step-by-step -step approach. So when it comes to a step-by-step -step approach, we're actually looking at three areas, which is um, order smart, shop smart, and also um, smart cooking. Mm. Okay, can, can you elaborate more? But because you know why sometimes you order food uh, from food delivery, so we can't control the food, how much salt they put in. So how do we control food that we order from uh, food delivery? Mm. Yes, yeah, so now food deliveries are out there and it's really an increasing trend um, over the months as well. So um, about 80% of uh, Singaporeans actually consume food, um, eat out once um, a week at least. Okay, so for example, um, just a bowl of fishball noodle soup or even miro boots would already meet exceeding our recommended daily sodium limit. Okay, so um, with all our uh, yummy hawker delights, you know, with the sauces, seasoning and gravies that comes along with it, um, it's something that uh, is a part and pleasure of life and something that we really, really enjoy as well. Okay, so I think today we can share with you all some little, little tips that we can actually bring whenever we are eating out at a hawker. So I think that is something that um, is good to have handy with us. Okay, so the first thing to watch out for is the gravies and soup. Mm. So the gravies and soups are actually the ones that are actually um, contributing to that high amount of sodium intake. So whenever we can, we can ask um, our hawkers to actually give us less, okay, or actually um, refrain from finishing the entire bowl of soup. Mm. Mm. Okay, so I think this is something that all of us are guilty with. You know, that saucer at the side. And we love to dip in. Do you, Samson? I do, I do. And you I thought do? So, I thought soups were always very healthy. Yes, you know, yes, I, I yes. would drink the whole miso soup and I realized it's very salty, but uh, am I supposed to do this, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so refrain from finishing the entire bowl. And of course, um, you know, the little saucer at the side where we dip our soy sauce and also our chili sauce. So just one tablespoon of soy sauce already meets about 50% of our daily recommended sodium limit. Mm, so we have to really watch out as well on the sauces and seasoning and also dressings that we are dipping at the side. So whenever we can, um, we can ask our hawkers if they are able to serve it separately. Mm, so we can dip as and when sparingly, okay, mm. instead of just having it all in our meals. Mm -hmm. okay? So another thing to uh, watch out for, of course, is our favourite processed food items and highly salted food items. Mm. So whenever we can, try to opt for the fresh lean items like mm. sliced fish or a lean meats instead. You know, when, when the hawker serves us our dish, and you know, at the end, we will like to put the little toppings, mm -hmm. yeah, the fried um, anchovies, the cambilis and shallots. So mm. all that actually adds up as well. Mm. Mm. So what we can actually do is to um, swap it over. So whenever you can find some fresh um, herbs instead, we can go for some um, spring onions, um, you know, fresh spring onions, or maybe we can go for some coriander, or even some fresh cut chili as well. Okay? Mm. So these are some tips that we can actually go for. And not to forget our favourite staple, so rice. Mm. Mm. So when it comes to rice, we love our favourite rice. Chicken rice, nasi biryani. Sounds so good now, I'm hungry even. Mm. <laughs> okay? So what we actually recommend is actually, instead of the flavoured, go for the plain instead. Mm. Okay? And when it comes to the noodles, uh, when you can choose your noodle option, try to, instead of the yellow noodles, go for the white noodles like the kway teow, bihun, or even better, go for the whole grain options that uh, might be readily available at your hawkers as well. But of course, when it comes to healthy eating at a hawkers, I will never forget our favourite last. Do you know what it is, Samson? What is it? Vegetables. Oh. Is that your favourite? <laughs> I do. Um, I have yeah. started eating vegetables more now. That's awesome. Mm. Okay, so vegetables is very important. So whenever we can ask for extra vegetables, that's great. Okay, so remembering our SHF, um, Heart Smart Eating Plate concept. So that is a very good concept to actually have in mind when we are eating out at our hawkers. So sometimes it's a little bit hard, you know, to get that proportion right. Sometimes it's a little bit more on the rice and a little bit more on the protein. But that's alright, we do what we can. So you ask for extra vegetables, so you add that volume and bulk of the meal. And whenever you can, um, you know, eat out at a certain um, food um, stall, try to see if you can get more vegetables in. Because that's really high in fibre, we can keep, which can actually keep you fuller for longer periods of time. And really help with weight management and blood pressure management and of course your heart health. And it ensures that you don't overeat on the other portion of the meal, like the rice portion and the meat dishes as well. Mm. Mm. 
So there's so much to uh, change. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, if you want to live long, make sure you do the changes right now. Okay, so uh, one more question for you now. How do we identify sodium in the groceries that we buy? How can, where can we look at it? Mm. Okay, so now that we have that array of choices isn't it, at our local supermarkets, and there's so many for us to choose around. So um, I think um, whatever choice that we actually make in the supermarket, when we can make um, a smart choice, that can really um, affect uh, the overall sodium consumption for us and our families as well when we are cooking for them. So instead, swap out from the high sodium items to the lower sodium items. So as a first start, um, we can have a look at the logos. Um, of our food um, packaging. So now the health promotion board actually has a lower in sodium logo that we can look out for. This means that the product actually has about 25% lesser sodium as compared to a similar product. Mm. Okay, and next, of course, um, secondly is the ingredient list. So when it comes to the ingredient list, um, that is where we know what is inside our food product. So it's really helpful to have a look. So the ingredients are actually listed according to descending order by weight. So if the first three ingredients contain salt or sodium in them, generally you know that it's a higher sodium product as compared to another of a similar range. Mm. So another thing to watch out for, of course, sodium might not just be called sodium, isn't it? There are so many, many other names. Okay? So the chemical name for sodium is Na, but of course there are other names like our good old MSG, so monosodium glutamate. Okay, and then um, sodium, um, you know, benzoate, and also um, you know, sodium nitrate, and of course, um, there's so many many different names out there that we watch out for whenever we are trying to purchase any um, sodium products. So next, we can look out for um, now. There's a lot of products out there that is um, lower in sodium that are created, or maybe salt-free, low in salt. Um, you know, or reduced salt. So these are names that we can also watch out for when we are trying to look at our food packaging as well. Okay, so of course, whenever we can, fresh is best. Mm. Mm. So whenever we can, try to go for the fresh um, produce instead. Whenever we can go for fresh lean um, chicken, fish, you know, tofu, eggs as our main staples, fruits and vegetables, okay? Those that are without the packaging, those are really good ones instead of the processed and the highly salted items. And I think it's also very important to do a pantry audit. Mmm, <laughs> yes. <laughs> because some of our food items might taste sweet, but actually they might contain salt. Mm. Samson, do you think ketchup has um, salt in them? I think there should be because some ketchup are like a little mm. sour and sweet as well. Right? Awesome. Yeah, yeah, you're good at that, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. So ketchup, about one tablespoon of ketchup, okay, actually has about 10% of our recommended really? sodium limit. Yes. How about cereals? Do you like cereals? I love cereals. You love cereals, yes. So the plain cereals, just one and a half cup, actually has about 15% of our recommended sodium limit. Mm, how about ice cream? Do you like ice cream? Yeah, same. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so when it comes to ice cream, just a mini ice cream, yeah? A chocolate mini ice cream has about close to 10% of our recommended daily sodium limit. Really? Yeah, so actually all these sweeter food items do contain some level of salt in them. And I think this is something that we have to be mindful of as well because when it comes to sodium consumption, every little thing actually adds up to our overall sodium intake in a whole day. Mm, so wow. Being mindful, I think, is a good way to go, isn't it? Wow, today is uh, yeah. really an eye-opener for me, even as oh. a moderator. <laughs> so if you're listening and watching, ladies and gentlemen, it's really time to you know, save our lives. It's like the blue pill or the red pill, you know? <laughs> the reality of, 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 of the matrix, but uh, it, it's true. Now we learn so much, even in ice cream, there's sodium in it as well. You yes. know, we think it's always sweet, but there's so sodium and it's re really a lot more. Okay, now, um, we have one more question. Will I eat healthy if I cook my own meals and eating outside? Mm, definitely, okay. So when it comes to cooking at home, that's definitely something that we usually encourage everyone to do so because mm. we are able to manage the amount of sodium that we are actually cooking with mm. our meals. But sometimes it's actually um, very important um, to be mindful as well because we might be just mindlessly you know, using salt shakers or maybe adding um, MSG stock powder with our meals. And what happens is that one teaspoon of so, um, you know, um, could, it, could it be salt would already exceed our recommended daily sodium limit. Mm, so something to, to be mindful of is, of course, back to the basics, fresh is really best. Mm. So whenever we are cooking for our families, 
think that we if we can go for fresh items. So when we are cooking a stir fry, go go for some fresh lean um, protein. You know, chicken, fish, um, eggs, tofu, beans. Okay, and then add, um, add in some fresh vegetables. Okay, instead of going for the processed, highly salted, preserved items like the fish balls and fish cakes, which actually has higher sodium content. Okay. Mm, so another thing we can um, watch out for also, I think we can get creative, you know, when it comes to the kitchen. Mm, we can actually experiment with herbs and spices as well. There's so many out there and it's really beautiful. So what we can go for, maybe we can um, go for um, like onion, ginger, garlic, you know, to really bring out the flavour of our meals. And we can now season um, even with um, you know, coriander, spring onion or even parsley, you know, oregano. And we can also, um, for some zest. Some fresh lime and lemon juice is actually a good option as well. So when it comes to um, you know, cooking at home, these are some things to really um, watch out for. And um, another part is of course to reduce our salt um, you know, gradually as well. So something that we are guilty of when we are cooking. Sometimes when we cook, we don't really taste, test and check. You know, and then we just put in extra salt, extra seasoning. So a good start is that you can taste your food first. Mm, do you think it's okay? If you think you need a little bit more salt, okay, then maybe you can add in. But of course, you can use the alternatives one that will be better. So there's uh, also now like lower sodium soy sauce available um, and also salt alternatives as well that are readily um, available. So of course, when it comes to home, um, I think everyone really loves snacking. Yeah, do all of us love it here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so even myself included, okay, when it comes to snacking. So when it comes to saltless snacking, have you heard of it, saltless snacking? No, what is it like? Mm, okay, so what, what it means is actually we can swap out, you know, whenever we are, you know, watching a television, we might go for our bag of potato chips, you know. Your favourite, isn't potato it? Potato chips and yes. prunes and Yes, salty definitely, things. you know, salted nuts, you know, mm. it's very easy to overeat especially. Mm. So what we can do is to make a healthier swap instead. So we can go for the baked and unsalted nuts, okay? Or we can even go for roasted um, chickpeas, edamame beans, or even roasted seaweed as well. Okay, or we, we can also go for um, things like your um, whole wheat crackers, or you know. Fruits. Yeah, definitely fruits is a very good option. Um, or even, um, you know, your um, rice cakes, you know, with 100% um, nut butters. So these are very, very good options that we can go for and enjoy our snacking and not um, feel guilty about it. Mm. Mm. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, so much information and so much for us to change your habit of eating and also not just a habit of eating, but a habit of having the other condiments around our table. You know, I used to take the uh, black sauce and I pour it all over my rice, my chicken rice. Oh my God, mm. I've been doing it all wrong. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why it's time to change and that's why we have this program for you. Yes, okay. Uh, so this just reinforced uh, my earlier uh, <coughs> statement that is that most of us do prefer a little bit of salt in our, mm. in our food items. And that's why it's so uh, ubiquitously uh, present in all the uh, food that you consume. So the idea here is really to cut down on the discretionary salt part because it's already present mm. in a lot of food stuff. So there's no need to add on any more uh, salt and salt uh, in whatever food that you're consuming. And if you have to use salt, uh, perhaps some kind of a salt substitute uh, mm. will be uh, preferred uh, with a lower sodium. Uh, so mm. there are a lot of oh, preparations right now where they reduce the sodium content in the salt and increase the potassium content oh, instead. So trying to uh, reduce the salt uh, content here. So, so we have to really look at the packing and, mm -hmm. and read the finer details of the <coughs> description of the, of, the, of the, the salt, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Now, this question goes out to all the three of you as well. What is the difference between, uh, some say, I don't take salt, but I want to take uh, natural sea salt or Himalayan salt. Can you help us to, to, to elaborate a little bit more? What's the difference in all these salts? Mm. Okay, so uh, what's the difference is actually Himalayan salt and table, table salt, you know, all the different kind of salt, they actually contains comparable comparable amount of sodium by weight. Mm. So one teaspoon of Himalayan salt and one teaspoon of table salt actually has equivalent amount of sodium. Yeah, so maybe um, it could be down to the different processing that it goes through. That Himalayan salt or sea salt might have a little bit of trace minerals like potassium, you know, magnesium, that, that these are things that people are looking into. But it's important to be mindful 
that um, you know the amount that we are actually consuming is actually very trace uh, amounts and it's mm. not able to confer any health benefits and these minerals instead we can actually get from a healthy balanced diet instead so when it comes to choosing the kind of salt that you go for what is most important today to be mindful of is the amount mm. yeah so the amount that you are taking is very important to be mindful of mm. so if you like a coarser texture from sea salt you can go for it but be mindful that it's really the amount that you are taking mm. well since you're on the, the topic of salt uh, we have a little question for you as well now during cooking at home we put one tablespoon of less sodium soy sauce and one tablespoon of oyster sauce is that a lot mm, okay Yes, so when it comes to, you know, um, cooking, you know, thank you so much for this question. You know, it's very easy for us to actually use our favourite condiment, soy sauce, you know, oyster sauce, and it really all adds up. So when, when you look at it, um, you know, all together, by using one tablespoon of the less sodium soy sauce, okay, and one tablespoon of oyster sauce, all together actually adds up already about 80% of our daily recommended so sodium lot, limit. Huh? Yes, so that actually adds up. So what we can actually do is that um, we can probably use um, less of it and then substitute with some um, you know, herbs and spices that we were discussing today. So onion, ginger and garlic are things that we can do to really bring out the flavours of the meal at the start. Mm. And then after that, we can probably use a little bit of spring onion, you know, coriander to really flavour our meals. Even fresh cut chilli as well to add that zest and spice. Mm. Okay, and then reduce the amount of um, soy sauce and oyster sauce that we are using with our meals and see that if this is something that we can actually um, go for as well. Mm. Mm. Thank you from Trizel Chong. And now Prof Tan, question from the audience. It's time for Q&A right now, folks. If, not, if, if, if you don't know what's happening, is because we've shared so much information, it's time for us to hear from your point of view. So this question is from Christina Ko. I am an elderly above 70 years of age. I have low sodium uh, shown by my blood test. Now, CT scan of my whole body is normal, but what steps can I take to increase my sodium to a normal level, Prof? So obviously we want to know what is the cause of the low sodium in your case. Is it because of your own diet uh, pattern or is it because of your physical activity or is it because of some kind of underlying medical conditions that cause uh, sodium to be low? So, so you have obviously undergone some kind of uh, ex investigations and checked up and, and CT scan is normal. So while actually most of the pe people uh, with uh, low sodium actually do not manifest any symptoms actually, uh, we don't really have to have a perfectly normal Sodium, but obviously when the sodium goes really low, something like uh, less than 125 uh, millimole per liter in your blood system, then uh, some may manifest with symptoms of lethargy or fatigue or even a little bit of uh, confusion in severe cases. So what I would uh, say that uh, uh, most of the people with low sodium don't have to do anything about it. You just need to go on your normal diet because there will be plenty of sodium uh, content in there. But if it's persistently low, then we need to really examine and see what's going on here, and particularly if the low level is, 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 is very significant. So, so I would say that uh, before you start indulging yourself with lots of salty food and so forth, please check it out with your own doctor. Mm, so check with the doctors first, everybody, about your condition and what kind of food that you can have as well, okay? So uh, I've got one question for Pui very quickly. If, if it's, is it normal for my hands to feel cold when I exercise? Um, it that depends uh, on the weather. I think if, let's say, your aircon is turned on too, too strong, your hands may feel cold. Mm. Uh, but if there's some underlying circulatory problems, that can also manifest during exercise. So we will advise that if it's quite bad and you see the colour of your fingers turning blue and you know, it's, it's not something that's normal and it's worse than it was before, we will ask you to try and see a doctor to check it out. Uh, but otherwise, if it's, it's quite mild, then we can, you can try things like warm up, warm up uh, and not turning up the aircon too much. Uh, warming up will actually help to improve circulation before you actually start your regular exercise. Mm. Mm. So you can do like fist pumps when you warm up just to, you know, get, the blood, the, yeah, mm. get the blood going to your fingers. There you go. Now, a question for Prof Tan coming from Gabriel Chia. Now, do health screening results indicate whether one has hypertension? So the way to diagnose hypertension is, of course, to record your own, the blood pressure. Mm. However, a single encounter with a doctor in a screening session is not going to be able to diagnose hypertension. Mm -hmm. You could have a blood pressure that is elevated in that screening clinic, but that doesn't mean that 
you mm. necessarily have uh, hypertension. So when you visit doctors in a clinic, uh, first of all, we, we need to make sure that the blood pressure is properly taken. And there are certain criteria by which we need the proper blood pressure measurement. And you have to have a repeated uh, elevations of the blood pressure in different uh, clinic visits and showing a consistently elevated reading. Then that will fall uh, into somebody who possibly may have hypertension. So maybe, Samson, what is normal blood pressure to you? You know, if you have an idea. I have no idea. Well, a normal blood pressure is 130, 85 and mm. below. So that will be average blood pressure. Uh, but the optimal blood pressure is 120, 80 and below. Mm, but see. when you have a blood pressure reading that's 140, 90 in the clinic consistently above that, then that could be hypertension. But like I say, you need to be able to uh, measure the blood pressure uh, properly because when you go and see a doctor in a clinic, uh, naturally you'll be very anxious. This is a strange person that you're looking at. This Fear, is a strange yeah. environment. There will be underlying anxiety and it can drive the blood pressure to go up. Mm. So I think before you do any blood pressure measurement, there are five steps that you need to prepare yourself first before uh, you start measuring the blood pressure. Firstly, you need to rest for about five minutes or so, calm yourself down. You know, it's not going to be after your tennis game. It's not going to be after a quarrel with your family member. You need to calm down for five minutes first. And then you have to be seated comfortably. And we would like you to be seated with your back against the wall, your feet on the ground first, and that uh, with the arm rested on the table, that will be your ideal position. And then you need to avoid all these caffeinated drinks and like coffee or tea or coke or, or smoking and, and, and alcohol at least 30 minutes before any blood pressure measurement. And fourthly, you need to go to the bathroom first and uh, empty your bladder before you measure your blood pressure. And finally, you shouldn't be talking uh, neither the doctor nor the person who is being uh, checked up should be talking at all during the blood pressure measurement because that's obviously going to affect the blood pressure reading. So a proper blood pressure technique uh, is really, preparation is very important and the technique of measurement is also very important before we diagnose one as having hypertension. So what, what sort of device can I use to diagnose hypertension? I think there are a lot of uh, uh, devices out there. Uh, we do approve uh, automated oxalometric sort of BP sets, uh, so that the sort of thing where you can just press and then you compress and then you release on its own. So those blood pressure readings are quite good. So we also encourage people to take their own blood pressure measurement mm. because that will give me the more readings you take, the better idea of I having, uh, the better idea that I have of your natural BP trend and average and so forth. So when you start uh, recording BP for the first time, I would suggest that you check your BP on both sides of your arm, so right side and left side. And whichever reading that is higher, in the arm, uh, you will use that reading uh, uh, the arm for your future uh, measurement. And every time you do a blood pressure uh, recording, you should be doing two measurements uh, at least two minutes apart and take the average. And that will be a good reading to, uh, to take uh, for your own uh, measurement. So there you go, Gabriel. The best is, of course, to have a machine at home so you can actually check it every day and every average day. As we all know, if you go and see the dentist, your heart will start pumping. When you see the principal in school, you start pumping, you know. So that's quite normal. Fear and anxiety will increase your reading. So have one at home and then, uh, that will solve a lot of problems as well. Okay, uh, next question, Prof, for you is what other steps can be taken to eliminate the risk of hypertension? So I said before, it's going to be a combination of lifestyle as well as your uh, uh, perhaps a use of medications in the case where the uh, lifestyle alone uh, cannot handle it. So while majority of cases of people with hypertension, uh, we don't know really the cause of it, but it's probably some kind of genetic basis and so forth. So we can't alter the genetic part of things, but we can alter the expressions of that gene. So by your own uh, lifestyle. So by that, with reduction, keeping your BMI to a normal or between 18 to 25, Keeping your uh, sodium, dietary sodium to consumption to less than 2 grams of sodium per day. Stop smoking, exercise regularly, stress manage. All these are very important uh, measures uh, as far as uh, preventing uh, hypertension is, is concerned. Remember, remember, hypertension is a lifestyle disease. And it comes along with the other lifestyle chronic conditions that we all know of, diabetes and cholesterol. So these three things come together as a metabolic syndrome. And by doing all this, uh, undertaking all these healthy lifestyle changes, you actually not only prevent hypertension, you also prevent diabetes as well as uh, high cholesterol problem. 
Mm, so the keyword is less is more. I mean, less salt is more life for you. Okay, next question for Nat, Natalie. Are vegetarians less prone to develop hypertension? Is this a myth? Mm, okay, so when it comes to vegetarian diets, um, what, what it means is that, you know, um, the, the research has been showing, for example, if you are taking more plant-based, quality plant-based foods instead of a lot of animal products, so what happens is that the overall diet um, usually is lower in saturated fat, trans fat, and higher in complex carbohydrates and fiber. So usually, um, you know, a diet like that has been associated with lower risk of hypertension and also cardiovascular disease mortality risk as well. But like we mentioned, it's very important to be um, mindful about the quality of the diet when it comes to a vegetarian diet. So sometimes, you know, we might have the processed food items, you know, like the mock meats, or maybe we can go even put it on chips, you know. And also, um, you know, things like we could go for the refined grains, you know, all this could be highly salted and also higher um, in, you know, refined properties as well. So mock meat as well, you know, this is something that we are, it's really um, rising and, you know, it's yummy because it really mimics you know the taste of meat isn't it? I thought I was saved I went vegetarian and I tried mock meat no mm. I thought I was saved too yeah <laughs> okay so when it comes to mock meat right um, is that um, of course because it tries to mimic the flavor and taste you know so there's a lot of um, different salt and seasoning that are added inside so one patty of the mock meat could already come close to about 20% of your recommended sodium limit so when it comes to a vegetarian diet as well um, it, it's not really about um, you know whether you're vegetarian um, or not but I think it's about the quality of the diet mm. that you're having that is really essential if it's um, overall lower in saturated fat trans fats you know salt sugar and sodium that we are mentioning today and higher in you know fiber and also whole grains you know and also um, all of the goodness that you can have from fruits and vegetables for the vitamins and minerals then that wholesome diet is actually what we are looking at when it comes to overall health management for blood pressure diabetes management and also um, heart health management as well. Mm. Mm, there you go. Right, next question for Pui. Now Pui, what exercise is good for people who are in the late 50s that is not too strenuous? Okay, thank you for your question. Okay, as to which exercise is good, I think it's really up to the individual. Personally, I would say any exercise is good and all exercises are good. So it's really you should pick exercise that you, should, you enjoy and that you like and that you see yourself doing for a reasonable length of time, you know, like in the years, you will still enjoy this exercise, then go for it. But if you have no idea what exercise is good and you don't know what you like, then I would say a good, reasonable exercise would be just brisk walking. Because it's very accessible, you can do it at home, you can do it in the parks, you can do it on a treadmill, you can do it anywhere, anytime. Uh, but if you have, let's say, you, you don't have such good knees or you have ankle pain or something like that, what you can do is you can try cycling. For, so for cycling, you, your body weight is not on your, your ankle or your painful knees, so that's also a good alternative. But really, any exercise is good, and I would say all exercises are good. So uh, aerobic exercises that helps you to get your heart pumping, and resistance exercises, which helps to keep your muscles strong. Flexibility exercises, which helps you to keep you flexible, make sure that you are not stiff. And balance exercise is also very important for people who are a little bit more elderly, uh, because it helps you to make sure that you don't fall down and you can still maintain coordination and stability when you're older. Mm. And uh, Pui, now that people are actually working from home, how can they achieve 10,000 steps a day when they are working at home and letting their fingers do the talking? What are your recommendations of exercises at home? Okay, I must confess, it's, it's really a lot harder when you do not even need to walk to the bus stop, when you do not even need to walk to the car park to get your car. You do not need to walk to the coffee shop to get your food. You know, everything is just at arm's reach and you... you order. Yes, order, <laughs> correct. So it's a lot harder, but exercise is really about discipline and secondly about habit. So once you have determined for yourself that this is something that you really need to do, then you, you kind of have to, make, to, to enforce a little bit of discipline to make yourself do it. So my advice is if you think of the time that you save from traveling, having to um, drive or to, to take the bus or the MRT, you can actually use this time to exercise while you are working from home. Mm -hmm. So, and if you don't want to go out because um, you rather stay at home, then there's so many other videos, there's so many videos on 
uh, YouTube, uh, Heart Foundation has like plenty of videos that you can follow. Um, that you can you know just turn on and follow whenever you want, any time of the day at all. So or you can simply do a little bit more housework, um, wash your car a little bit harder, scrub the floor a bit harder, and that will that will increase your physical activity levels even though you're working from home. Mm, so you have to be creative, ladies and gentlemen. Find time. If you have no time, make time. You might want to jog maybe 12 midnight or early at 5 a.m. You know, there's always no excuse. I believe if you really want health uh, to be so badly, so I'm sure you can find some creative ways. Even while watching TV, you can always have a bottle of, a pet bottle of 1.5 yes, water. Right. Just, you know, do a bit of gym work at home with the things at home, you know stretch bands and all that. So I'm sure you can find something. So list down some things that you can do at home while you're working at home. You know, no more working outside, but work at home, you can still exercise. Okay, we're down to our final question, ladies and gentlemen, and this is going out to uh, uh, Prof Tan from Gabriel, uh, Gabriel Chia. He says, are men more prone to hypertension than women? I will answer it as saying that both genders are prone to developing hypertension. <clears throat> and so I do not think that uh, one is bad from the other. But what I would say is that because majority of hypertensions are what we term essential hypertension, it tends to occur in the middle age group, so between 50 to 60. But once you have somebody who is very young, say in the 30s or 20s, starts getting a hypertension, then we will really have to be very suspicious of whether there are some underlying secondary causes to this hypertension. Are uh, there something else that is happening here besides the genetic uh, thing that I talked talk about earlier on that caused the hypertension? And some of the common conditions are hormonal disorders, uh, tumor, hormone producing tumors, kidney diseases, and so forth. And so for young hypertension, be it male or women, I think uh, warrant further investigations, but I would say that uh, both genders are prone to hypertension. Mm, so don't discount both are at may at risk as well. Okay, so take note. Now we've come to the end of our program, but of course before we go, we'd like to have our speakers to say a few more things, maybe to share some closing remarks or some tips. So I'll start with uh, Puyi first. Well, take care, everyone, and stay young and fit and healthy. Make mm. time for exercise. What about Nat? Mm. Okay, so thank you everyone for tuning in and I think um, when it comes to the overall management, moderation is key and also it's important to lean back to our SHF, Heart Smart Eating Plate concept um, to ensure that you have a variety of nutrients in your daily diet to help lower your blood pressure and your health management risk. And Prof Tan? Well, we, I, I just want to say that the causal link between sodium intake and hypertension is very well established and I hope that in today's sessions, you learn about uh, the importance of uh, watching your sodium intake and how you can go about uh, reducing the sodium intake to reduce your risk of hypertension. So well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you, the audience, and also the speakers joining us today. And we hope you have learned how to shake the salt habit to lower your hypertension. Now, for more information on the hidden salt in our food and heart health, you may visit the National Heart Week slash World Heart Day 2021 virtual event at myheart.org.sg slash World Heart Day. And also you can join Hugo in Hugo Poly, an interactive single-player game, to learn more about salty facts and stand a chance to redeem attractive prizes. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, have a great afternoon and use your heart to connect to your family and also friends as well and uh, take care of yourself. Saying bye-bye for now.